Hello, gathered friends, I'm Furor Nuva, and welcome to Bionicle Deep Dive, where we analyze the tropes, characters, and lore of LEGO Bionicle. In the last video, I did my deep dive into the three virtues, the core morals of the Matoran culture. In this video, I wanted to explore the six principles, the sub-virtues the Matoran hold that they derive from the main three. They were introduced in Matsunui the Online Game 2, The Final Chronicle, where the player, as Hali, travels the island of Matanui, learning about the various cultures of each village as a part of her training for the Koli tournament. The principles are a relatively obscure part of the lore that really only appears in that one game, which itself is really only a side story. However, I believe that they are some of the most interesting tidbits of the lore of the island, and not only do they do an amazing job of fleshing out the cultures of each Matoran village, they also provide insight into the true meaning of the events of Mask of Light. Let's dive right into it. While all Matoran honor the three virtues of unity, duty, and destiny, due to differences in their cultures, the people of each village tended to emphasize one or two more than the others. From their focus on those one or two virtues, they each developed a principle that also guided their lives. As such, the principles offer an amazing insight into the cultures of each village and how the themes of their element translate into their values. Each of the principles had an enemy, an opposing value that undermined them and brought strife and chaos. What's really interesting is that each of the enemies of the principles was embodied by one of the Rakshi sent by Makuta. It really adds to the myth-like significance of the events of Mask of Light, as not only were the Rakshi terrifying opponents, but also physical manifestations of Makuta's desire to corrupt the ideals of the Matoran, ideals given to them by his spirit brother, Matanui. The Toa were literally fighting against the Matoran equivalent of the Seven Deadly Sins. The principles also granted those who followed them certain skills, skills that were used heavily in the game of Koli. Since each village had its own principle, they each specialized in a certain Koli skill, which, in the online game, meant each village's team was a different kind of challenge. The game also allowed you to train in each of the skills by meeting with and talking to members of the village who understood their principles the most. Now, the connection between the principles and Koli skills may lend major credence to the theory that the Koli tournament was, in fact, a means for the Turaga to identify and train new Toa as in order to master the physical skills of the game, they would also have to develop moral skills that would be vital for future heroes to learn. The theory is also helped by the fact that 6 out of the 12 players in the tournament did in fact become Toa at various points. I discussed this theory in greater detail in one of my earlier videos on whether the Traga knew who was destined to become Toa. Check that video out if you want to hear more. In any case, it's clear that there was a large spiritual significance to the game of Koli in Matoran culture, paralleling some real-world sports that have been used as a part of spiritual rituals. Particularly, this provides a much deeper parallel between Koli and lacrosse, aside from its obvious similarities. The stick version of Koli is clearly based on lacrosse, which itself was based off of the stickball games played by indigenous people in eastern North America. These games traditionally carried a high spiritual weight to them, often organized by elders as a symbolic alternative to warfare to resolve conflicts between villages. This is much like how the very first game of Koli was created by Wenua and Anawa as a means to resolve a conflict between the Unumatoran and Pomatoran. And if my theory that the Koli tournament was used by the Turaga to train future Toa is correct, then we see another fascinating parallel. As in the real world, the stickball games were often preceded by the same rituals that the warriors of those nations did before battle, and the games were used specifically as a way to train their warriors. Now, were all of these parallels between Koli and the real-world history of Native American stickball intentional? Honestly, I can't say. Though, it's nice to see parallels between Bionicle lore and indigenous cultures that may be a bit more respectful. Looping back to the principles, let's take a look at each of them. The virtues that they come from, the skills they grant, and the symbols associated with them to get a better look at the culture of the Matoran and the philosophical themes of their element. In the game, each of the virtues, principles, and skills has a charm symbol associated with it, so we can use the symbology of these to see what other meaning we can derive. Let's start with the charms of the three virtues, and then I'll go through each principle and skill charm when we get to them. 
The charm for unity shows six dots all connected to each other in a circle. Pretty straightforward, as six represents the six Toa and the six villages, and they all come together as a group. The charm for duty shows a singular dot surrounded by two curves that don't quite make a circle. I'm not sure what this is supposed to represent, but if I had to guess, maybe something about focus on duty. The curves kind of vaguely resemble a simplified version of the curves in the three virtue symbol, so maybe it's like that? The destiny charm is two dots, each with curves showing they're swirling around each other. I think this symbol might be an abstraction of the yin-yang symbol from real-life Taoism, which the full three virtue symbol is also loosely based on. In Gakoro, the Matorn of Water emphasize unity, and from it derive their principle of purity. Purity takes unity one step further going from multiple different people coming together to truly becoming one in terms of intention. All parts of the team coming together, moving in the same direction towards the same goal, with the metaphor being that pure waters are easier to pass through. The Gamatorn also talk about purifying their minds from negative thoughts so that they can move and act with intention, and the clarity of mind that comes with purity is said to even grant visions that Toa Gali and Turaga no Kama seem to have. They also believe that they were tasked with keeping the waters of the island pure, showing an appreciation for the natural environment. The Gamatorn were also excellent weavers, and believed that their weaving was an excellent representation of unity. The symbol for purity seems to be derived from the symbol for unity. It has the same circle as before, but instead of six connected dots around the edge, there's one dot in the center. I believe this may symbolize the six truly becoming one in their focus and intention, showing how purity is about taking unity even further. The enemy of purity was poison, embodied by the Rakshi Lerak. The poison of Lerak not only brought on physical illness, but also degraded the victim's mental state, as shown with Tahu. Kotu mentions that pride is a poison, which makes sense, as it can cloud the mind and detract one from unity, as one is solely focused on themselves. The opposition between poison and purity is shown best in how the healing powers of Gali's water cured Tahu of Lerak's poison. Purity grants the skill of speed as the focus on purity of intention means that when they move, they move singularly towards their goal, rather than being pulled in multiple directions. Hali trained in speed by chasing a Takia shark. The symbol for speed is three dots with lines coming off of them to look like they're moving fast. In Pokoro, the Matorn of Stone emphasize unity and destiny, and from them derive their principle of creation. Creation is about bringing things together to build something beautiful, like they do with the stones in the marvelous sculptures that they carve. The Pomatorn value their art and creating things, particularly physical things that last. The symbol for creation is a swirling pattern, perhaps taken from the circle of unity and the swirling dots from destiny, to show the many things coming together. The enemy of creation was disintegration, embodied by the Rakshi Gurak. Disintegration caused things to fall apart and fade away, crumbling to dust, leaving them both separate and lost to time. Creation grants the skill of strategy. One has to strategize and plan ahead if they are to create something grand that lasts. And that strategic thinking translates into Koli. It's interesting that the Pomatorn skill would be mental rather than something physical, like strength, given that Pomatorn are stronger than average than the other types. Though, perhaps this makes sense. Pomatorn already have a natural physical advantage, so in order to improve, they have to get better at the strategy of the game. Holly trained in strategy by herding Mahi goats, since multiple goats will run at a time, knowing which order to grab them is needed to get them all and to get them all efficiently. The symbol for strategy shows a grid with a dot in the middle, showing planning and organizing. In Onukoro, the Matorn of Earth emphasize duty and destiny, and from them derive their principle of prosperity. Prosperity combines duty and destiny by being about working hard towards a goal, 
and through that work attaining the wealth to provide for themselves and their community. In this, duty represents hard, diligent work, and destiny represents an ultimate goal. As they work in the mines searching for riches, they say that it is their duty to dig and their destiny to find them. It is interesting that, despite the emphasis on wealth, those who follow prosperity believe it distinctly guards against greed. The symbol for prosperity shows six dots that are arranged in a triangle, like they're piled up on top of each other in a pyramid. This shows the accumulation of resources and how built up things become from prosperity. The enemy of prosperity was hunger, embodied by the Rakshi Vorak. Vorak takes the strength from others, leaving them weakened and hungry. Wanua tells Hali after she defeats the Onokoro team that she is welcome to celebrate, but if she were to gloat, then the vanity would bring hunger. It is interesting in that how it is described, hunger seems associated with vanity and greed, being insatiable and wanting more than you've earned, in particular taking it from others and leaving them with nothing. So we can see that the emphasis on duty and hard work are key. It's not about having things, but working towards them and building genuine prosperity for yourself and for those around you. If we were to get even more philosophical, it seems that prosperity is about adding to the world around you through the effort you put in, whereas hunger is about a zero-sum mindset that the only way to gain for yourself is to take from others. Prosperity grants the skill of stamina, and the Onomatorn are able to play for much longer than players from other villages. The level of work ethic required to pursue prosperity grants them their tremendous stamina, as they are always working to better themselves and their people. Hali trained in stamina with Tepu by hauling rocks for long distances. The symbol for stamina shows three dots connected in a chain, perhaps representing unbroken stamina. In Kokoro, the Matorn of Ice emphasizes destiny, and from it derive their principle of peace. Peace is about a state of calmness, logic, and acceptance. Destiny brings peace when one grows to accept their role in the larger cosmos. Komatorn are known for their quiet stoicism and contemplative nature. They rarely express their feelings and tend not to act openly out of emotion, even though they very much have emotions. It is believed that peace grants an understanding of Matanui's will and an ability to know the future to a degree. And with this comes acceptance. The Komatorn, both on Matanui and Metronui, care deeply about prophecy and the future, so it makes sense that destiny and peace would be high priorities for them. Peace is sometimes described as a state without change or chaos. This is interesting as it contrasts with how the Pomatorn see destiny as a state to reach. This shows how destiny is viewed in many different ways in universe, as some view destiny as change and as transformation. The symbol for peace is two dots with an S-shaped curve in the middle between them, and this symbol is definitely inspired by yin yang, which is also a symbol of peace and harmony. The enemy of peace was anger embodied by the Rakshi Kurak. Part of the reason they seek peace in Kokoro is to avoid anger, as they believe the mountain they live on is a perfect representation of both peace and anger. On the peak, nothing grows and nothing changes, a state of complete peace according to the Komatorn. But when the mountain angers, it sends snow and avalanches crashing down. The Komatorn believe that if they anger, the mountain angers, so they seek to remain in a state of peace. I also think that it's interesting that the enemy principle of the Ice Matorn is a character flaw that so often plagues the heroes of their opposite element, fire. Peace grants the skill of willpower, which is constant awareness, self-control, and focus. The Komatorn had great focus and body control while they played. Hali trained in peace and willpower by attempting to bounce vertically on a thin spike of ice. If she leaned too far one way or the other, she would begin to wobble and tip. Only by remaining calm and centered would she succeed. The symbol of willpower is one dot on the bottom with three lines going vertically from it, perhaps showing the centeredness of willpower. In Lake Coral, the Matorn of Air emphasized unity and duty, and from them derived their principle of faith. 
Faith was about trusting themselves and their comrades, working together and looking out for one another, providing them with a deep belief that things were going to turn out okay. Unity represented them coming together, and duty the sense of unshakable obligation to each other. That trust that things will work out allows them to take risks with little hesitation, and is cited as the reason why they have the courage to run across the treetops and sail the skies. Their faith also represented in their love of music and song, which was used by the Lamatorn to keep their spirits up during the dark times. I think it's also telling that they don't emphasize destiny, as one of the things air elementals are known for is their impulsivity and not worrying too much about the future, rather living in the moment. The symbol of faith is a dot with lines emanating from it and a curve just beneath it, and depicts a sunrise, which is often associated with hope and new beginnings. The enemy of faith was fragmentation, embodied by the Rakshi Panrak. Fragmentation represented things falling apart and breaking, both in the literal sense of broken things and the spiritual sense of broken trust. They saw a rot that infected branches and caused them to break apart as embodying fragmentation, as those were branches that they couldn't trust and would send them falling to the swamps. Faith grants the skill of accuracy, and the Lamatorn were incredible at hitting their shots. They believe that faith is what guides their discs and their holy balls, trusting themselves and their abilities to see them through. Holly trained in accuracy by going to the Lake Horror disc throwing range and hitting the targets. The symbol for accuracy is a dot in the center of crosshairs. In Takoro, the Matorn of Fire emphasized duty, and from it derived their principle of courage. To them, courage meant pushing on despite fear or danger, and putting your responsibility and the well-being of others above yourself, even when it was hard. The Tamatorn were known as some of the bravest and most courageous warriors on Matanui, and Toa of Fire are often depicted as the boldest of Toa. The symbol for courage is a single dot in the center, with two lines that start straight and curve up when they go around the dot. Not entirely sure what this means, though it does almost look like the duty symbol had the curves around it squeezed in, perhaps showing it's a more concentrated version of duty. The enemy of courage was fear, embodied by the Rakshi Turok. According to Kapura, courage is the soul of movement and fear stops all and leaves you frozen. This is consistent with Turok's ability to leave its victims frozen in fear. Kapura espousing ideas of courage and movement is interesting, due to his characterization of always moving slowly and cautiously. But through his practice, though he appears slow, he can cross great distances. He never stops moving forward. Even if he's slow, he doesn't stop. And when he does move, he's faster than any of the other Matorn showing perhaps the hidden courage of Kapura. I find it very interesting and kind of tragically ironic that in Mask of Light, Jaller is killed by Turok, the Rakshi of Fear, as Jaller is perhaps the character who most of all represents duty and courage. Duty is a central theme to his character, and multiple times Jaller is referred to as the bravest of all Matoran. And yet, it is the power of fear that killed him. Though, if you watch his death scene, you wouldn't know it. Despite the fact that his body and mind must have been flooded by the most concentrated fear energy imaginable, he never acts afraid, even when in direct contact with the Turok staff. On the one hand, perhaps this shows the true courage of Jaller. It certainly cost him, though. As... After his resurrection, Jaller struggled with fear and PTSD from his death. And yet, he still led his team bravely. Courage grants the skill of strength, allowing the Tomatorn to throw their Coley balls harder and faster and wrest the ball from their opponents. Holly trained in strength by hurling Coley balls at stone pillars to knock them down. The symbol for strength is a large dot in the center, surrounded by three dots around it. So now that we've covered all of the principles individually, I wanted to take a look at how they, and how also the skills, tend to intertwine with each other in very interesting ways. What's also interesting about the skills is that each of the skills actually helps with another. 
showing that these are not opposing values, but rather fit into each other and play off of each other. Strategy training is helped when you have speed, as it becomes easier to catch up to the running mahi. Speed training is helped by stamina, as stamina improves your ability to hold your breath, which is what limits the amount of time you can chase the takia shark. Stamina training is done by lifting heavy rocks and becomes easier when you have strength. Accuracy is also helped by strength, as the stronger you are, the faster your discs fly and the easier it is to time your shots. Now, willpower, accuracy, strength, and strategy are all helped by each other to a varying degrees, especially in the game, because each of the mini-games for training them involve timing and mouse control. Willpower is particularly helped by accuracy, as the precision to hit the shots makes control over where you lean more easy. Accuracy, in turn, is helped by strategy, as both involve predicting where the target will be. And strength is helped by both strategy and accuracy, as the strength minigame requires you to time and predict where your strength is at its peak. And so, since the skills support each other, this suggests that the principles that grant them also support each other. In particular, notice how each of the skills derived from only one of the virtues is helped by a skill derived from the other two. Like how speed derived from unity is helped by stamina derived from duty and destiny. This shows how they need each other to round each other out. Tenosit on Tumblr also pointed out that you can see the connection between the principles and the skills in other sports that the Matorn played on Matanui. The lay Matorn who would race birds say that it is their faith that keeps the wing beneath their wings. For the Tomatorn, it certainly took courage to surf on lava, and the Gamatorn's team rowing certainly took focused, singular unity and speed. How destiny, peace, and willpower fit into a snowball fight for the Komatorn is unclear, but I suppose they would need great focus to keep balance on the ice rink. Now, despite the extensive details about the principles given in Minog 2, the fact that they only appear in that one game means that there's a lot about them that we don't know, namely their origins. Were these beliefs that the Matorn held throughout their history, or are these beliefs that specifically emerged on the island of Matanui? While it is known that the Matorn held the three virtues since the first awakening of Matanui, and believed in them while on Metronui before the Great Cataclysm, we don't have the same certainty about the principles. Personally, I have three headcanon theories about them, and I can't quite decide which one I prefer the most. It's very possible that these were values the Matoran had during their time on Metronui, and honestly, many of them make a lot of sense, as they still fit the cultures and roles the Matoran had there. On the other hand, I do think the idea that they developed them on Matanui is very interesting. That their hardship was so great while under the threat of Makuta, they developed an additional set of ideals to live by. Would also make the Matoran of Matanui unique in comparison to other Matoran in the Matoran universe. And the third headcanon I have about them, which I think might be my slight favorite, is that the principles came from the Turaga, who developed them based on their experiences as Toa. And in particular, their experiences as Toa Hordika. Each of them struggled with the Hordika transformation in their own ways. Ways that, when analyzed, actually can tie in nicely to the principles and the principles' enemies. Most of these characterizations of the Hordika I'm taking from the Challenge of the Hordika novel. So, like, Nukama very noticeably struggled with the feelings of corruption that the transformation brought, and how it caused the Great Temple to reject her. So it makes sense that she would focus on the ideals of purity and pass that on to the Gamatorn. Anawa began feeling very destructive, which contrasts with the principle of creation. His violent impulses also notably hampered his ability to think strategically, which is why he might have taught the Pomatorn the skill of strategy. Wanua very notably wanted to run off into the night and hunt and disappear, never having to deal with his responsibilities. This would mean abandoning his duty and destiny, the virtues prosperity is based on, and his desire to hunt might perhaps show a dispensation with hunger. 
Nuju was most disturbed with the feelings of uncontrollable anger that his transformation brought, and how he took all his willpower to keep his Rahi side in check, which would explain why he would emphasize peace and willpower. Matau struggled heavily with feelings of hopelessness and despair. In addition, his harshness towards Vakama during the arc contributed to the team fragmenting. His journey during the Hordika arc centered around rekindling his own faith, and then later rekindling Vakama's faith and bringing him back and healing the team. And with Vakama, it can be argued that the root of his problems lie in his struggles with his fears and his feelings of self-doubt that led him to act too hesitantly at first and then too brashly to overcompensate. What he needed was a more balanced view of courage, and perhaps he taught that to the Tomatorn. Again, the connection between their struggles and the principles is just a headcanon of mine, but one I find very compelling due to how it connects to their personal arcs and the cultures of their people. The idea that these are the things that they struggled with, so they would focus on teaching them to the Matorn. I just find it very compelling, you know? But what I think makes the principles introduced in Minog 2 truly so significant was Holly's journey of understanding them, which was so important to understanding her character arc up until the movie of Mask of Light. Obviously, the training and tournament aspect of it explained why she was able to win the Koli Championships for Gakoro. But even deeper than that, I also believe that it shows how she was able to bring the people of the island together at the end of the movie. It ties into a prophecy that the Seers in Kokoro were studying. Nuju mentions that Holly's victory in the championship is vital to the island's survival, and one of the acolytes predicted that she would end up uniting the island. This turned out to be true, as the training she did to master Koli also taught her the confidence and what she needed to say to bring the island together and lead them through Makuta's lair. During her speech, she heavily invokes the three virtues and the values of the islanders. I believe that during the story told in the online game, she developed a deep understanding of the virtues through training to understand the principles, as in the beginning she didn't really know much about them. Moreover, I believe that her ability to speak in such a way that all the islanders were rallied by her words comes from the fact that she spent time getting to know the various people on the island. Much like Takua before her, she didn't just stay in her village, but went on a journey to all the villages of Matsunui, talking to them and helping them with their problems. She knew what to say because she knew what was valuable to them. Her ability to understand them is what enabled her to do this, and I believe that that understanding came from her learning and studying all of the village's principles. In addition, the spiritual significance of Koli and how its skills tie into the morals of the Matoran adds layers to the final climactic duel between Takanuva and Makuta. Makuta, who throughout the movie, sought to tear Chikua away from the Three Virtues, challenges him to a game whose mastery requires the players to master the principles derived from the Virtues. They weren't just playing sports ball. Makuta was symbolically challenging him to a test of his moral fortitude to see if he would fail. Makuta wielded the powers of all of his Rakshi, who each embodied the enemies of the principles. And as the Toa of Light... More so than any other Toa, Takanuva had to embody all of the three virtues, and his final test was to go up against the being who embodied corruption of all these values. Makuta knew that he couldn't beat Takanuva and all the Toanuva in a straight fight. Heck, they might even kill him without meaning to, given how Takanuva's powers were his primary weakness. So instead, he challenges the Toa of Light to a duel in which they would have to limit the use of their powers, in order to simultaneously manage his own defeat and potentially erode Takanuva's morals. This desire to confuse Takanuva's faith in his morals is evident in his dialogue, in particular his statements that make it seem like Makuta is the one protecting Matanui. So we see that more than just a physical confrontation, the Koli battle between Takanuva and Makuta was a battle of morals. 
So yeah, the symbology of it all is amazing. <laughs> Would have been great if any of that significance was portrayed in the actual movie itself. Because <laughs> without the context of Minong 2, it really seems like they just randomly decided to play lacrosse for the fate of the universe. <laughs> this is why I always tell people who are trying to get into Bionicle to not just watch the movies without reading the rest of it first. I've seen people go into the movie blind, and while they enjoyed it, they clearly thought, that was such a trip. Really fun, but I only understood half of it. And it's not their fault. Thinking the first movie would be a good place to start is a reasonable assumption. It would make sense that at least most of what you need to understand the story should be found in the movie itself, rather than a significant part of the thematic core only being built up in an obscure and infamously glitchy and grindy web game. But... Mask of Light was clearly made for established fans, and it would have been hard to fit everything in that was going on in just 70 minutes. And the scattered nature of the lore means a good bit of that subtext is either lost or hard to find. But uh, once you get that context, it's like, oh god, this is amazing! And this is also why I believe Bionicle needs a comeback, if for nothing else than to give it a second draft to polish it up and present it in a way that really shows off its strengths as a story for more people to enjoy. So, while the principals may have only had a one-off appearance in a semi-canon game, they are, in my opinion, some of the most interesting parts of Bionicle lore as they provide huge insight into the culture and philosophy of the Matoran, and add incredible depth to some of the most impactful moments of the series. But, those are my thoughts on the six principles featured in Minog 2. What do you guys think? Did you enjoy this look at Matoran culture? And what do you think of the added significance these new layers add to Mask of Light? <laughs> like everything with Bionicle, there's always new layers to explore. Anyways, that's all for this video. Be sure to tune in next time when we conclude this broader look at the themes around the three virtues with a deep dive into the mysterious inner workings of destiny in the Bionicle universe. Until then, I'll see you guys soon. Take care, my gathered friends.